kind thanks go to Brilliant for sponsoring today's episode. Today, amongst other things, I'll explain to you when we might see another attempt at a 15km flight from SpaceX's Starship and why Rocket Lab recovering an Electron rocket booster is a huge deal for the whole space industry. What about it? Go for launch. Or go for launch. Let's light this candle. Ignition sequence start. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It? And as always, there has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates Hello Y family! What a week! After Scrubtober, where lots and lots of rocket launches were shifted over and over again, we're finally on a better trajectory again. There's something happening almost every day again and I've as always picked a few very interesting topics for us to dissect. Let's start with SpaceX's Starship. What you're looking at here is SpaceX's South Texas launch site, or short Boca Chica as many know it. That's actually just the name of the little village next to the SpaceX facility. Seen through the lens of Mauricio from RGV Aerial Photography, details can be made out that would otherwise be hidden from the ground perspective. Support RGB if you can, follow him on Twitter or become a flight supporter on his Patreon page to help him with the next flight. First of all, let's take a quick look at Super Heavy Booster Number 1. Team Super Heavy is pushing it to the limit. All the segments sitting here outside the large manufacturing tents are meant for that first booster. And if we compare the pictures taken on November 13th with the latest one from November 19th, we can see that one more segment has appeared. It's yet another large four-ring tank segment. Looking at it from another angle, we can see the hull of booster serial number one growing inside the high bay. The main difference between building a starship and a super heavy hull right now seems to be the need for a scaffolding. Never seen before when stacking starship hulls, SpaceX workers have erected a two-story scaffolding to be able to access the hull from the outside. Next to the growing booster Starship Serial Number 9, the backup plan for Starship Serial Number 8 can be seen including aft fins. Boca Chica Gal from NASASpaceflight.com recently was able to film the stacking of Starship Serial Number 9's nose cone in another night shift for the space community. Make sure to show her some love in the comments. This makes one thing very clear. Team Serial Number 9 is putting the launch site under pressure. If there is no launch soon, Starship Serial Number 9 cannot proceed to testing. So let's take a look at what's happening at the launch site. What is SpaceX doing to accelerate the progress towards the Starship Serial No. 8 launch? Right next to the Boca Chica Beach, SpaceX is working relentlessly to construct a spaceport worthy of their goals. The site where Starships are actively being tested needs upgrades. This is not yet the place where an orbital launch can be performed and, as it seems, also not quite the place where Starship Serial No. 8 can spread its fins and soar up to 15 kilometers in a first step to finally move beyond hopping and into actual launches. After the recent static fire involving a Martite problem you can find out all the details about on episode 134, SpaceX is looking at another delay. Let me be perfectly clear that this is absolutely normal. This is early prototyping with an incremental design approach, failures and mistakes are what fuels this kind of development. Every time a mistake is made, it opens up the door for a better and more suitable solution. Looking at another beautiful picture from Mary's camera, the pad can be seen up close. Lots of hours have been spent on shielding the pad and Starship Serial No. 8 from the dreaded shrapnels. Raptor engines seem to be breaking off from the concrete pad under the test stand every time they are ignited. For this, power and fuel lines have to be protected on the stand and inside the Starship engine skirt to prevent it from failing again during a critical test. Long term, SpaceX might have to look for another option, like a proper flame diverter system, but if this helps for now, it's good enough. On Mars, you don't have a landing pad or a flame diverter anyway. Looking at a direct comparison between November 13th and 19th, the repair done on the concrete pad can be seen as well. It's hard to tell if this is the famous Martite from episode 134, but nonetheless it looks to be in a much better shape now. And SpaceX seems to be confident too. They have filed a few new and very exciting road closures for Highway 4, leading past construction and launch site and being closed down every time a test is conducted to ensure public safety. November 25th, which will be tomorrow, and November 30th with December 1st and 2nd as backup dates. In particular, the second primary date is of high interest as it states the serial number 8 15km flight as the reason once again. 
Musk and his team want to produce another milestone before the end of the year. If Starship Serial Number 8 takes flight this soon, we might even see Serial Number 9 fly before the start of 2021. And hopefully soon after that comes Super Heavy. SpaceX's mighty booster rocket dwarfing a full Falcon 9 rocket including fairing. For orbital launches though, SpaceX will need an orbital launch mount. The test stands are too small for a full Starship stack. And as many will already know, SpaceX has been building such a mount for a while now. And it's glorious. Mauricio's pictures always give an excellent feel of scale and location. This is his latest panoramic shot of the whole launch site, including the beach all the way on top. We have the tank farm, Starship serial number 8 on pad A, right next to it pad B. In the middle we have the very large landing pad. It's much larger than a Falcon 9 landing pad, no doubt in preparation for a possible unprecise landing. And above that we have the orbital launch pad. A few weeks back I speculated that there would likely be some kind of infrastructure surrounding the orbital pad and SpaceX is right in the middle of building it. But what exactly is it? I've been studying the pictures for a while now and there is really nothing yet that I would put my bet on. It's the beginning of a foundation for some sturdy building. A possible fuel terminal for arriving fuel lines from the tank farm. Tanks, pipes, valves and connectors take up space. Mary was able to take some pictures from the ground and first walls being put on the foundation can be seen already. Would that much space be needed only for a fuel terminal? As always, tell me in the comments. It's going to be interesting to see what SpaceX comes up with. There is one more possible solution of course. Elon might just want to show the world who's doing all this. We get it Elon, you rock. The Y team needs your support. Give the video a like, subscribe and share it to show the YouTube algorithm that you appreciate the content. Want to give a more direct support? Consider becoming a patron or a YouTube member and get awesome perks like access to our Discord server where I discuss space topics with the community every day. Do you know about the Y warehouse? Shop for your next Starship shirt or grab our famous Raptor blueprint shirt and countless other shirts made by space nerds for other space nerds. Links can be found in the description, you rock. SpaceX is heading straight for a full reusable rocket. A concept that will deeply change the way we can access space. They are not the only ones though on their way to a reusable rocket future. Rocket Lab recovers first electron booster. Rocket Lab, a US based small launch provider with launch sites both in New Zealand and in the United States is one large milestone closer to having a regular booster recovery in a similar way to what SpaceX has been doing with Falcon 9 boosters for years now. Led by CEO Peter Beck, an original New Zealand Kiwi, Rocket Lab has had a steep rise to fame in the past few years. Founded in 2006 and only 14 years old, the launch provider can be categorized into the same bracket as SpaceX. Young, very innovative and strongly motivated to leave a footprint in space. Their launch vehicle Electron is a two-stage liquid propellant rocket capable of delivering up to 300 kilograms to low Earth orbit. Mainly settled in the small set business, the company has been able to secure a steady stream of customers for years now. Four, three, two. On November 20, Rocket Lab executed their 16th flight from their Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand. The name of the mission was Return to Sender and this gives us a good clue as to what the mission's milestone was besides delivering another 30 satellites into space. It was to retrieve an electron first stage back from orbit in one piece or as close to one piece as possible. Later in the future this process will be completed with a helicopter catching the booster out of mid-air while it's sailing down under a parachute. But that was not part of this first step. To understand the difficulty of achieving such a milestone with an electron rocket, we have to look at the form factor of the booster. It only has a payload capacity of around 300 kilograms even without recovery hardware. Drogue chute, parachute, RCS systems including gas bottles and additional electronics have to be fitted in for a recovery attempt. As a funny side note, for this launch Rocket Lab had a special guest in the payload ferry. Noam Chomsky, gifted by Gabe Newell, co-founder of the popular gaming network Steam, Very high. it was a charity effort. For every viewer of the launch stream, Newell donated a dollar to the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at Starship's Children's Hospital in Auckland. Thank you, Gabe. Gabe, Ben. 
and the launch played out as intended with no anomalies. At an altitude of around 80 km, stage separation occurred. At this point, we're not going to focus our attention at the payload that, by the way, got inserted into orbit without any problems. We're going to follow the booster back down. With the Rutherford engines turned off, the reaction control system reoriented the booster 180 degrees and placed it on an ideal trajectory for re-entry. The recovery hardware for this flight was integrated between first and second stage. When the booster had decelerated below Mark II, a drogue chute was deployed to increase drag and stabilize the booster on descent. Then, in the final few kilometers of descent, the main parachute, a large 18-meter ring sail similar to what Apollo capsules used, got deployed to enable the booster to perform a soft splashdown in the ocean. Once in the water, recovery vessel then approached the booster and successfully lifted it out of the ocean. Returned back to the factory, the booster is now going through its inspection. This is the very reason why Rocket Lab made this first attempt of recovering a booster. The inspection after re-entry will give Rocket Lab valuable data on how the booster survived the re-entry. It will give them an idea on which part worked as intended and what might need fixing or redesigning. The current plan is to do a few of those splashdown recoveries. Once the booster is perfected, Rocket Lab will then proceed to the mid-air recovery, enabling them to achieve their goal. The main reason for the efforts is not to reduce launch costs. It's to increase launch cadence. If Rocket Lab can use flown boosters on future missions, it will enable them to do more launches on more launch dates, which is particularly important in the small set business. I had the opportunity to be part of the official closed press conference Rocket Lab recovery update on November 23rd, so merely 48 hours after the booster had arrived back at the factory. Let's listen in to what Peter Beck himself had to say about the state of the booster and some other very important questions. What I am very pleased to report is the test was a complete success. All the recovery systems on the vehicle work flawlessly. Now that the stage is back in the factory, our plan is to dissect the stage. So we've got a lot of work, a lot of material work, testing work to do on the composite stage and making sure that all the material properties of the composite are, are good. So the plan here is to um, continue to splash them down into the ocean until we recover stages that are back in premium condition. And we really understand the entry dynamics. Now we actually know the loads and we have got great visual evidence about which parts of the heat shield work really well and which parts failed. So the, the way we've been approaching this is that the best way to do this is, is actually iterate and, and by getting actual hardware back. So first of all, congratulations on the flight. Absolutely awesome to watch. It's a huge milestone forward for Rocket Lab. And where do you see Rocket Lab in 10 years based on these early results? 10 years is an extraordinarily long time horizon for Rocket Lab. Generally, we, we will work in months. Um, what, I, what I will say is that in a shorter term, I think this is going to have a really positive effect on the launch industry. You know, if we can really pull this off where we can just put it back on the pad and, and have really minimum interface with the stage to get it ready for flight, then the economics are going to change. You know, small launches is always like the, the Uber of the industry, right? I mean, of course, it's going to um, improve production, but um, it has the potential to, to really change the economics as well. How much is, is uh, your reusability going to change this launch cost? Is there an effect on, on launch cost as well? If we can get the reusability to the point where uh, it, it is really light touch between flights, then, then of course the, the economics change. You know, the majority of building Electron, the majority of the cost of building Electron is in stage one. If you can fundamentally shift the economics of that, then, you know, you fundamentally shift the economics of the vehicle. And test is going to be required, but um, if, it's, if it's a relatively small amount, then you know, I expect the economics to change. Yes, I did. Um, Peter, you were pretty uh, dismissive of, of recovery of uh, even the first stage and you better head on uh, that you would not uh, attempt this, but now you're doing it. I actually am curious. Is there really going to be a hat eaten? Is it going to be blended up, put in a smoothie? It's a topic of, of much discussion here at Rocket Lab right now. I'm, I'm okay with the hat, but apparently it's, it's, not, it's not particularly good for you. I'm, I'm keen for the real thing, but we'll see where we end up. By achieving this first booster recovery, Rocket Lab has demonstrated that Electron can be recovered. Now it's all about the details and about repeating the results on future launches. Well done, Team Rocket Lab. Another launch provider entering the era of reusable rockets. Another small and thriving company reaching for goals not even the old and large launch providers are able to accomplish right now. 
If you're looking at polishing up your STEM skills to maybe even enter this fast-growing market of launch providers in the future, today's sponsor might be exactly what you've been looking for. Brilliant is a website and app that makes learning accessible and fun. Their approach is based on problem solving and active learning. It's about seeing concepts visually and interacting with them and then answering questions that get you to think. Their courses are laid out like a story and broken down into pieces so that you can tackle them a little bit at a time. No tests, no grades, just pick a course based on what you'd like to learn and get started. Made a mistake? No big deal. Just check out the detailed explanations. Whether you want to brush up on the basics of algebra, learn programming or learn about cutting-edge topics like neural networks. To learn things the brilliant way and at the same time support What About It, go to brilliant.org slash whataboutit and sign up to try out over 60 interactive courses for free. And if you choose to get the premium subscription, the first 200 people to join through the link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Learn new things the brilliant way. Links in the description. Today's Patreon and YouTube member shoutout goes to Christopher Peck, Jan Krall, Jesse Martis and many others. You rock! Thank you for all your support to the whole Y team. You make all this possible. If you're not a patron or a YouTube member yet, consider supporting the channel. Awesome perks like our thriving Discord server, ad-free previews of episodes and your chance to talk to the team and me included. Last but certainly not least, my thanks go out to the ever-growing team. All the people you see here chose to gift their talent to the project. All of them improve on one or even more aspects of the show and without them this channel would look a lot different. Thank you very much for your help, have a great Thanksgiving and enjoy your week everyone. Yeah! Long Term SpaceX, Long Term SpaceX. Hello, my name is Short Term SpaceX. It's very short. So let's take a look at what ha what's ha 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 November November 25th. Newell donated a dollar to the to the to, to the dead little dip the dip and which part did not work as intended and second as clutch the plutch.